Y está escribiendo en este momento con Samuel Moyne de la Universidad de Yale un libro sobre historia legal de eh, la guerra de Vietnam. Es un privilegio y un honor para la Universidad del Pacífico contar con la presentación del profesor Heiler en materia de detención y selección de objetivos en conflictos armados, el uso y el abuso de la analogía. Eh, sin más, eh, y agradeciendo al profesor Heller por su presencia, los dejo con su ponencia. Muchísimas gracias. Well, let me first um, thank the ICRC and the University of the Pacific and, of course, my friend Alonzo for the invitation, uh, my first time in Lima, and this is an auspicious way to begin my travels here. Um, so. I don't know exactly what title they have actually given to my talk. This is what I have entitled it. Um, and in my presentation today, I want to discuss two um, critical issues in terms of how the U.S. approaches international humanitarian law in non-international armed conflict. I want to discuss who qualifies as a combatant in non-international armed conflict and thus someone who can be targeted anywhere at any time with any amount of force. And second, I want to discuss what limitations exist in NIAC on the detention of combatants and civilians. Um, can I get some tape? I don't want to break it. Now, I've chosen those issues for two reasons. The first is because the U.S. has claimed very broad targeting and detention authority in NIAC based on a series of analogies to rules of international humanitarian law that are designed for IAC, for international armed conflict. And I want to argue today that those analogies are very difficult to defend legally. And the second reason why I want to focus on these issues is because militaries in South America have seemed largely and, and perhaps strangely silent concerning how they understand the relevant rules of IHL and the relevant rules of international human rights law in non-international armed conflict. So just to kind of pick one almost random example, if you look at Colombia's Directive 15, it has a surprising amount of information about when hostilities rise to the level of a non-international armed conflict. Yet the same directive says absolutely nothing about who qualifies as a member of an organized armed group within a non-international armed conflict. Now, I think that silence is problematic in and of itself because it seems clear that many militaries in this part of the world go well beyond what they can do under the laws of IHL and under international human rights law. Still? All right. I'll move this. 
Is that better? Is that okay? Okay, I'll stay a little bit over here. Um, but it's also problematic because the silence of militaries in this part of the world, I think, also makes it more likely, as they have in the past, that they will look to the United States to provide them with legal guidance. And given that I think the U.S. approach to non-international armed conflict is very problematic in terms of targeting and detention, uh, it would be equally problematic for militaries in South America to rely on the U.S. as precedent. Now, before proceeding, just one quick note. I am, for the purposes of this presentation, going to assume the applicability of international humanitarian law. I'm going to assume that there is, in the context I'm discussing, a non-international armed conflict. Obviously, that's a very difficult issue. It's one I believe Lori will touch on in her keynote. Um, but for, again, for our purposes, I'm going to assume that IHL applies because there is, in fact, a non-international armed conflict. Start with just very quick review. Let me turn first to targeting. The central principle of targeting in international humanitarian law, as everybody in this room knows, is the principle of distinction. And the principle of distinction is set forth most clearly in Article 48 of the first additional protocol. And I won't read it to you because I know you are all capable of reading. Um, this principle, the principle of distinction, applies in both international and non-international armed conflict. So the same targeting rules apply to both. What are the rules? Well, if an individual is a combatant, he can be targeted anywhere at any time with any amount of force. And let me just run briefly through these. Let's begin with anywhere. The rule that combatants can be targeted anywhere must be understood literally. Unfortunately, there are a number of scholars who, who share the far left side of the political spectrum with me seem to believe that a combatant can only be attacked on or near an actual battlefield. And there, there's simply no support in international humanitarian law for that proposition. You can attack a combatant behind the front lines. You can attack a combatant back at his base. You can even attack a combatant when he is at home with his family, assuming, of course, that proportionality would be satisfied. Similarly, a combatant can be attacked at any time. Nothing in international humanitarian law limits the targeting of a combatant to in the middle of conflict. So you can attack a combatant when he is out of uniform. You can attack a combatant when he is off duty. You can even attack a combatant when he is simply at home sleeping. And then finally, and with due respect to my friends at the ICRC, some of whom are in this room, there's also no restriction in IHL on the amount of force that can be used against a combatant. In other words, or to put it more starkly, it is perfectly legitimate to kill a combatant who, with very little trouble to the attacker, could either be captured or disabled. And these, of course, are very, very harsh targeting rules, which is why, of course, attackers must always properly distinguish between combatants and civilians. And of course, it's not always easy in the fog of war to distinguish between combatants and civilians. But of course, attackers are obligated to try. In fact, we have a provision, Article 51 of the first additional protocol that says, in case of doubt whether a person is a civilian, that person shall be considered a civilian. And just as kind of an unfortunate aside, the United States actually rejects this presumption. The new DOD Law of War Manual makes that absolutely clear. But fortunately, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only state <laughs> that actually rejects this presumption, although the presumption is interpreted very differently by states. But that's just a little bit of background. Principle of distinction, of course, raises a very important question. Who is a combatant in a non-international armed conflict? With regard to government forces, that's not a particularly difficult question. The ICRC has made clear in a, on the government side a combatant is anyone who, according to domestic law, is a member of the regular armed forces or some other kind of armed group that is part of the state or responsible to the state. And I'm just giving you a quote from the ICRC here. Non-state forces in a NIAC are much more complicated. Again, you will find some IHL scholars who insist that there are no combatants 
on the non-state side that, that anyone, terrorist, rebel alike, is simply a civilian who occasionally participates in hostilities. But that position is very difficult to reconcile with Article 1.1, right there at the very beginning of the second additional protocol. And again, you can see what the second additional protocol says. What Article 1.1 indicates is that non-state combatants in a non-international armed conflict who are individuals who are either members of dissident armed forces or who are members of an organized armed group. Dissident armed forces is essentially an anachronistic category referring to members of a state's armed forces that have turned against their own government. So for our purposes, non-state combatants are individuals who are members of an organized armed group, a group with sufficient military organization to engage in hostilities against the government. And everyone else who isn't a member of an organized armed group is a civilian. So that brings us really to the crux of the matter. Who qualifies as a member of an organized armed group in a non-international armed conflict? This is a difficult question. We need to admit that right off the bat. I see some heads shaking or nodding. And it's not just a difficult question. It is a deeply, deeply contested one. It's an issue about which the ICRC and the United States simply fundamentally disagree. Now, as you probably know, the IC oops, sorry, wrong direction. The ICRC has adopted a very narrow membership of defi narrow definition of membership in an organized armed group. According to the ICRC, an individual qualifies as a member of an organized armed group only if he assumes a, quote, continuous combat function in the group. And this is another selection, another quote from the interpretive guidance. This definition of membership means that a wide variety of individuals who are in some sense associated with an organized armed group do not qualify as members of that group. And because they do not qualify as members, they are not combatants and cannot be targeted. So what is not membership according to the IR ICRC? Well, carrying a membership card is not enough. Owning a uniform with, of an organized armed group is not enough. Wearing a fixed and distinctive sign of an organized armed group is not enough. Certainly providing support, such as cooking or cleaning or, or accountancy for an organized armed group is not enough. Recruiting new members of an organized armed group is not enough. Financing an organized armed group is not enough. Propagandizing for an organized armed group is not enough. Certainly being sympathetic to the political or military aims of an organized armed group is not enough. And of course, because we're talking about a continuous combat function, even occasionally fighting for an or organized armed group is not enough to qualify the individual as a member of that group. Only what the ICRC calls, quote, lasting integration into the military wing of an organized armed group, in other words, repeatedly fighting on its behalf, qualifies as membership. Everyone else is simply a civilian who may well from time to time directly participate in hostilities. So a very narrow membership definition. The US rejects the continuous combat function definition of membership in an organized armed group. In its view, membership in an organized armed group should be defined by analogy to membership in a state's armed forces in international armed conflict. So here, for example, is what a federal judge said in the Garebi case. And you can see the reference to sources of IHL that apply only in international armed conflict, such as the Third Geneva Convention and the first additional protocol. This is very much a distinction with a difference. According to the US, an individual can be a member of an organized armed group in a non-international armed conflict, regardless of what role they play in that group, and regardless of whether they fight ever, much less in a continuous combat function. So who qualifies as a member of an organized armed group in the US view? And again, 
is a combatant who could be targeted anytime, anywhere, with any amount of force? Well, according to the US, at least the following. If you wear a uniform of an organized armed group, if you wear a fixed and distinctive sign of an organized armed group, if you carry a membership card of an organized armed group, even if you simply pledge loyalty to an organized armed group, you can be considered a member of that group who, by virtue of being a combatant, is targetable anytime, anywhere, with any amount of force. Nor does the US limit membership in an organized armed group to purely formal criteria. The US is also willing to infer membership in an organized armed group from a variety of types of actions. And we could kind of go on and on about this. Let me just mention two of, I think, the most troubling examples of where the US is willing to infer membership from an individual's actions. There's a case called Elmer Feldy versus Obama. Here, the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit held that an individual could be considered a member of Al-Qaeda because he was captured carrying a large amount of unexplained cash having stayed the night before in a known Al-Qaeda guest house. That was enough, according to the US, to consider that person a member of Al-Qaeda, who again is a combatant who could be targeted anytime, anywhere, with any amount of force. And then more notoriously, not I think anymore, but at times the US is considered any military aged male in an area of known terrorist activity to be per force a member of an organized armed group. So it's not difficult to understand why the US wants to analogize between membership in an organized armed group and membership in the regular armed forces. Why? Well, because doing so greatly expands the number of, quote, rebels or terrorists that it can target at any time, including the cooks and the cleaners and the accountants in an organized armed group. But I would submit that the US's analogy to international armed conflict and to the definition of regular armed forces is not just deeply problematic, but fundamentally flawed. To begin with, I think it is flawed as a matter of customary international law. Now, again, there's no question that the second additional protocol acknowledges that there are members of an organized armed group, but it doesn't in any way attempt to define membership. So if we're going to have a definition of membership in an organized armed group, it has to come from customary international law. And as my friend Yen Zolin at Cornell University has pointed out, the ICRC definition, the Continuous Combat Function definition of membership, actually has quite a bit of supporting state practice. This is just a quote from one of his recent books. Now, at least to date, neither the US government nor any sympathetic IHL scholar has attempted to show that the US definition of membership has greater support in state practice than the continuous combat function definition. Instead, they complain about the fact that the continuous combat function definition of membership treats non-state actors asymmetrically from regular armed forces. So on the one hand, this is what they point out, on the one hand, all members of the regular armed forces qualify as combatants who can be can targeted at any time, cooks, cleaners, accountants, etc. But because of the continuous combat function definition, only members of an organized armed group that regularly participate in hostilities can qualify as combatants who can be targeted at any time. So because the definition is asymmetric, there are more combatants in the regular armed forces than there are in members of an organized armed group. And according to scholars who are sympathetic to the US's much broader definition, this asymmetry introduced by the continuous combat function definition runs afoul of the so-called principle of equality in international humanitarian law. The idea that the same rules of IHL have to apply to all of the parties to a non international armed conflict. So, for example, William Boothby, who's a former lawyer with the UK's Royal Air Force, he criticizes the continuous combat function test for, quote, creating legal inequality between the opposing parties, thus eroding the international law assumption that the law applies equally to each party to the conflict. 
Now, I would suggest that this is an unpersuasive argument. There is no question that as a descriptive matter, conventional international humanitarian law is generally symmetrical, even in non-international armed conflict. In general, the rules of Common Article 3 and the Second Additional Protocol do, in fact, apply in the same way to government forces and organized armed groups alike. But from a positivist perspective, this principle of equality is not an inherent requirement of international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law doesn't have to be symmetric. In fact, states are more than willing to create asymmetries in IHL when those asymmetries work in their favor. So just to give you one example, this is the optional protocol dealing with children in armed conflict. This optional protocol has been ratified by 167 states, including the US and the UK, and also including Peru, and it is asymmetrical. The protocol categorically prohibits organized armed groups from recruiting anyone under the age of 18, but allows government militaries to recruit any soldier of any age as long as the recruitment is voluntary and knowing and consensual, etc. Moreover, the insistence on asymmetry, insistence on asymmetric, on, sorry, on symmetric definitions of membership in the regular armed forces and in an organized armed group is also hypocritical because most of the IHL scholars who reject the continuous combat function test on the ground that it's asymmetric endorse another symmetry, asymmetry, that happens to work, not coincidentally, in the state's favor. And that, of course, is the combatant's privilege. So my favorite example here is, in many ways, a wonderful scholar, a man named Kenneth Watkin, who is a retired Canadian general. He believes that government soldiers have the combatant's privilege in a non-international armed conflict, but members of organized armed groups do not, an asymmetry that he calls, quote, logical. Yet, at the very same time, he denounces the ICRC's definition of membership as, quote, novel and problematic because it is asymmetrical. So he's fine with asymmetry. He just doesn't like any asymmetry that might work against the interests of a government military. But even more importantly than that, insisting on symmetric definitions of membership in the armed forces and organized armed groups is simply inconsistent with why we consider all members of a state's armed forces to be combatants. Why do we assume that all members of a state's armed forces are combatants? Well, because they are all trained to fight and they can all be expected to fight if necessary. And in fact, they're all equally entitled to fight in an international armed conflict. The situation is very different for organized armed groups. Although some rebel cooks and rebel cleaners and rebel accountants may very well be trained and expected to fight, many, maybe even most, I, I don't know the sociological evidence, do not. Instead, many members, members of an organized armed group receive no military training whatsoever and assume solely non-combat functions in the group. So the analogy between military cooks and cleaners and rebel cooks and cleaners is simply not particularly enlightening. Now it's also not true that all individuals who are formerly part of the state's armed forces are combatants who can fight. On the contrary, religious and medical personnel in the armed forces are neither civilians nor combatants. They occupy this strange status of non-combatants. They are non-combatants who can never be lawfully targeted unless they directly participate in hostilities. And why do religious and medical personnel have this non-combatant, non-targetable status? Well, because their function within the regular armed forces has nothing to do with fighting, nothing to do with participating in combat. In fact, the US prohibits medical personnel from using weapons for any reason other than self-defense and prohibits religious personnel from carrying weapons entirely. So if we don't allow the targeting of medical and religious personnel in the state's armed forces, 
on the ground that they don't assume any kind of combat function within the regular armed forces. It is certainly not illogical to extend that rationale to individuals within an organized armed group that also do not function in a combat capacity and are also not expected to fight. Not just rebel doctors and rebel priests, but also rebel cooks and rebel cleaners and rebel accountants. And then finally, before we move to detention, it's important to note that the US definition of membership in an organized armed group is also very deeply problematic from an evidentiary perspective. Now, it's not difficult to determine who is a member of the government's armed forces. Even cooks and cleaners and accountants wear uniforms. So an attacker can normally distinguish between a cook, a cleaner, an accountant who is a member of the regular armed forces and a civilian contractor who is simply providing similar services to the military. The civilian contractor will not have a uniform, but the military's cook and cleaner will. The situation is very different for an organized armed group. Certainly some organized armed groups have uniforms or fixed and uh, identifiable signs and require their members to wear them at all times. Many do not. So it can be next to impossible for an attacker to distinguish between a cook or a cleaner or an accountant who is a member of an organized armed group and a civilian who simply happens to be providing similar services to the group without necessarily becoming a member thereof. And Niels Meltzer, who many of you will know since he spent many years at the ICRC, I think he captures this evidentiary distinction in terms of membership in an organized armed group and membership in the regular armed forces very well. And really, it's what Niels is saying here that explains why the ICRC insists on a functional approach to membership in an organized armed group. That's the only way to be certain that an individual loosely or less loosely associated with an organized armed group is in fact a member of that group. You look to see are they assuming the continuous combat function. If they are, they can be reliably considered a combatant and they can be reliably targeted anywhere at any time with any amount of force. So in short, to draw this section to a close, I think the ICRC definition of membership is legally, logically, and evidentiarily superior to the United States' much broader definition of membership. Yet, of course, the US continues to rely on analogy to push the boundaries of membership as far as is humanly possible. So that's targeting. Now let me turn to detention. In detention, the US relies even more heavily on analogy to international armed conflict than it does in the context of targeting. And it does so, I would suggest, for one reason and one reason only, because it wants to avoid the much more restrictive detention rules provided by international human rights law. So what are these rules? Just a quick refresher course. Well, conventional IHL rules concerning detention in international armed conflict are quite extensive. The internment of prisoners of war is authorized by the Third Geneva Convention. Prisoners of war can be detained to the end of the conflict without any kind of review whatsoever. In international armed conflict, the detention of civilians for security reasons is authorized until the end of the conflict. And that, of course, comes from the fourth Geneva Convention. Unlike combatants, the civilians do have to have the uh, necessity for their detention to be reviewed twice a year. So there are differences. But clearly, third and fourth Geneva Conventions authorize detention of both civilians and combatants in an international armed conflict. In non-international armed conflict, by contrast, conventional IHL is almost completely silent concerning detention. Unlike the Third and Fourth Geneva Conventions, neither Common Article Three nor the Second Additional Protocol authorize a party to the conflict to detain anyone. Doesn't, uh, doesn't authorize the detention of a combatant, doesn't authorize the detention of a civilian, no one. Authorizes, excuse me, authorization for detention is left to domestic law. Similarly, 
Neither Common Article 3 nor the second additional protocol specifies any procedural safeguards what for whatsoever for people who are, in fact, detained. They simply guarantee a minimum standard of humanitarian treatment for individuals who are, as a factual matter, detained in a non-international armed conflict. And here's the point. Because international humanitarian law authorizes and regulates detention in NIAC, but not, sorry, in IAC, but not in NIAC, the relationship between international humanitarian law and international human rights law is fundamentally different in the two types of conflict. In international armed conflict, international human rights law has very little to say about detention. And the ICRC openly acknowledges this. Quote, as the lex specialis, crafted specifically for situations of armed conflict, IHL applicable in IAC is the interpretive tool by means of which the interplay between this body of norms and human rights law may be determined. That's IAC. By contrast, the absence of detention-related rules of IHL in non-international armed conflict means that detention is regulated not by IHL, but by international human rights law. Now, I don't have the time today to explain in any great detail the functioning of the lex specialis principle. Suffice it to say here that no matter what version, no matter what understanding of lex specialis we adopt, all of them fill gaps in conventional and customary IHL by reference to international human rights law. Put it even more simply, if there is no IHL lex, <laughs> IHL cannot be the lex specialis. And this is a critical point, because although international human rights law certainly does not prohibit detention, there is little question that it imposes much greater procedural restrictions on detention than conventional international humanitarian law does in international armed conflict. And there are three differences that are particularly important here. I have them for you on the slide. Let me just summarize them. International human rights law, security detention, doesn't distinguish between prisoners of war and civilians. The same protections apply to both. So it's not possible under international human rights law to detain anyone without periodic review of the necessity for the detention, even combatants. Second, international human rights law entitles all detained individuals not just to periodic review, but to periodic review by a court or at least a quasi-judicial tribunal. IHL, by contrast, permits review by an administrative body that does not have to be structurally independent of the military that is doing the detaining in the first place. And then third and finally, international human rights law makes it almost impossible to justify detaining someone to the end of conflict. It's not impossible, but it is almost impossible. This is fundamentally different than international humanitarian law for which indeten indefinite detention of combatants and long-term detention of civilians is often the norm. So there are fundamental differences between IHRL detention and IHL detention in international armed conflict. And it's precisely those differences, I would suggest, <laughs> that it explains why the US is so keen to avoid having to apply international human rights laws detention rules. And how does it do that? How does it avoid IHRL? It does it by analogizing to detention rules of IHL that exist and apply only in international armed conflict. So, number one, it considers members of organized armed groups in a non-international armed conflict to be, quote, unprivileged belligerents who, like prisoners of war, can be detained until the end of a non-international armed conflict. In other words, it borrows the Geneva Convention 3, the GC3 standard for combatants. Second, it believes that civilians in a non-international armed conflict can be detained for security reasons until the end of a conflict and can have their detention reviewed right, not by a court or quasi-judicial tribunal, but by an independent, by a non-independent administrative board. And that, of course, is analogizing to the fourth Geneva Convention standard. And remember, before I move on, remember, 
the U.S. applies these rules on the top of its problematic definition of membership in an organized armed group. So it believes an individual who pledges loyalty to an organized armed group or who cooks and cleans or provides accounting services to an organized armed group who, um, they are combatants, who, if they're not actually targeted and killed, can be detained until the end of the non-international armed conflict with no review of any kind whatsoever. So the problem with the US analogy in the detention context to international armed conflict is its state practice doesn't even come close to establishing that the rules of the Third and Fourth Geneva Convention apply in a non-international armed conflict as a matter of customary international law. There's simply no evidence that those rules apply in NIAC. And that's critical because if the rules of the Third and Fourth Geneva Conventions do not apply to NIAC as a matter of customary international law, they cannot displace the more restrictive rules of international human rights law. As I pointed out earlier, every version of the Lex Specialis principle holds that gaps in conventional and customary IHL are filled not by airy-fairy analogies, but by prohibitive rules of international human rights law. In other words, to echo the famous Lotus case, detention in NIAC is simply not an area of international law in which, quote, every state remains free to adopt the principles which it regards as best and most suitable. On the contrary, there are now prohibitive rules of international human rights law that, via the principle of lex specialis, define the limits of detention in a non-international armed conflict. And again, it's also important to emphasize the hypocrisy of the US's reliance on the analogy to international armed conflict. On the one hand, the US wants to detain members of an organized armed group without review until the end of an armed conflict by analogizing to the third Geneva Convention. But what does it not want to do? Well, the US, of course, refuses to treat any member of an organized armed group as a POW, which is, of course, the most elemental requirement of the third Geneva Convention. So the US's analogy to the third Geneva Convention is conveniently, but certainly not accidentally selective. It wants to apply by analogy only those parts of the Third Geneva Convention that maximize its power to detain. Any aspect of the Third Geneva Convention that might work in favor of the detainee, it simply ignores with its analogy. Nor is the US content with simply detaining members of an organized armed group until the end of a non-international armed conflict, whenever that might be in terms of transnational terrorism. It also believes that it has the power to de indefinitely detain, without review, anyone who substantially supports an organized armed group as well. That position, as the US quite openly acknowledges, is also based on analogy to international armed conflict, in particular to Article 4A4 of the Third Geneva Convention, which permits the detention of, quote, persons accompanying the armed forces. And here is what the US has said in a legal filing. The DC Circuit, US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, has endorsed this analogy to the persons accompanying provision of the Third Geneva Convention. In a case called Al Bahani, the appellant argued that he could not be lawfully detained because he was not a member of Al Qaeda. He was simply a civilian contractor who was providing services to Al Qaeda. The DC Circuit rejected that argument, holding that even a non-member of Al-Qaeda is detainable if he engages in, quote, traditional food operations essential to a fighting force and the carrying of arms. Again, this analogy is not acceptable. Applying the persons accompanying provision of the Third Geneva Convention in NIAC has absolutely no support in state practice. There is not even a whisper of an argument that this is customary international law. So on what basis can it possibly be applied? Conventional IHL limits the detentions of persons accompanying to international armed conflict. It does not apply it to non-international armed conflict. And if there's no customary rule, again, 
there is no IHL lex that could keep out, push away a prohibitive rule of international human rights law. And again, to be sure, international human rights law does not necessarily prohibit the US from detaining individuals who substantially support an organized armed group. The priority of international human rights law simply means that the US has to conform its detention practices of people who, quote, substantially support an organized armed group to the rules of IHRL. It must determine the detainability of a substantial supporter by reference to the, quote, present, direct, and imperative threat detention standard of international human rights law. That may very well permit the detention of people who finance organized armed groups or who recruit for organized armed groups, maybe even those who propagandize in some ways for organized armed groups. But it would absolutely not permit the detention of the cooks and the cleaners and the accountants. And more importantly, because IHRL applies to substantial supporters, the US must afford anyone detained at all on the basis of substantial support with all of the procedural guarantees that international human rights law provides, particularly the ongoing independent review by a court or quasi-judicial tribunal, not the much more forgiving review standard that we find in international humanitarian law in international armed conflict. So to conclude, I believe, you don't have to agree with me, I believe that the US is in violation of international law any time that it kills or detains on the basis of a rule of international humanitarian law that it is simply picked up from international armed conflict and plopped down in non-international armed conflict by analogy. Yes, members of an organized armed group in a non-international armed conflict can be targeted anywhere at any time with any amount of force, but only individuals who exercise a continuous combat function in an organized armed group are in fact combatants. Yes, members of organized armed groups and those who provide them with certain kinds of support can be detained in a non-international armed conflict, but anyone so detained is entitled to the periodic review of their detention by a court or quasi-judicial tribunal of the kind that international human rights law requires. So to end, I think it's bad enough <laughs> that the US does what I would consider intellectual violence to both international humanitarian law and international human rights law every time it kills or detains on the basis of analogy. But it would be even worse if militaries in South America were tempted to look to the US for guidance and keep out international human rights law and, and hollow out international humanitarian law by relying on analogy to rules that were developed for and apply in and only in international armed conflict. Thank you. I said 40 minutes. Questions, hostile or otherwise? Ah, there's a hand in the back. Well, th thank you for this uh, explanation. I think it's very interesting what you're saying about these asymmetries in regards to the rules of, for example, detention in IAX versus NIAX. And my question is um, because sometimes um, now in this context we have NIAX that go to IAX but also IAX that go to NIAX. And then the question is, for example, you have in an IAC the obligation oh, to uh, liberate or repatriate once the conflict ends. But what happens could be addressed because the, the US policy would allow to treat everyone equally so to say, in both uh, conversions, transformations of the conflict, because they are applying the same rules. But if we follow these, uh, this approach of the Lex Specialis, we have to change the rules that we are applying, for example, to those detained during these IACs that are now NIACs. I agree. <laughs> uh, we always have to pay attention to conflict qualification. And as you said, 
Nyax can become Iax, and Iax can become Nyax, and Iax and Nyax can end, and they pick up again. And I, I know Laurie will be speaking a little bit about um, conflict qualification after <laughs> a recognized conflict does end. Um, you know, it, for me, it just it illustrates you know the, the particular danger of applying detention rules that that are based on the end or the possible end of conflict to conflicts that may never end. Maybe not the kinds of NIACs you see in South America, which are more traditional kind of rebel, you know, government forces. Eventually those will end. Transnational terrorism, is the war on terrorism ever going to end? Certainly doesn't seem to. It's been going on for a very long time. And so if you just, again, uncritically look by analogy to international armed conflict to borrow all of these detention rules that allow you to hold combatants until the end of conflict and civilians until the end of conflict, as long as you occasionally review their detention, these people could be very easily held for the rest of their life. And that, that's the importance of acknowledging that it is international human rights law that fills the gap in the conventional and customary international law, international humanitarian law that implies in NIAC, and not allowing the US to just kind of cherry pick those rules of international armed conflict that allow it to detain essentially forever. I mean, the nice thing about international human rights law is, again, it does not prohibit detention, <laughs> um, just as it doesn't prohibit the use of lethal force. It just regulates it much more narrowly than international humanitarian law. So in a detention context, if you're turning to international human rights law, good luck holding somebody forever. <laughs> they are going to have to have a relatively independent review twice a year of the need for their detention. And hopefully, <laughs> regardless of how you know, the conflict is qualified, will eventually be released. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long answer to a, a, a comment that I completely agree with. Yeah. Oh, now the hands are going up. Uh, whoever he hands the mic to. Thank you so much. That was um, a wonderful lecture. Thank you um, for going also into details on, on how this is uh, being covered in, in, in U.S. case law. And my question uh, goes directly towards that. Is th this narrow interpretation and th these analogies that are being used both on, on detention and targeting, would you say that there is a common interpretation among the different among different U.S. courts, or can we see, or have you seen in any case, um, courts that are arriving to, or stepping away, within the U.S., that are stepping away from this analogy? Is there any efforts in, in, in reflecting uh, the views, not only from the ICRC, but from the, the other states that are, are, are state parties to, to these treaties, of course? So yeah. uh, do you see any? It's a very good question, in that? And, and I should acknowledge that I, I haven't followed the, the U.S. cases over the past few years particularly closely. In fact, Lori may very well um, follow them much more closely than I. Um, I will say that at the time that I wrote this long chapter on analogy, um, there was in the kind of the earliest days of the U.S. invoking analogy in, in, de in the detention context because they didn't have to do it in a court for targeting because the person would be dead. Um, but in the detention context, at first there was, by individual federal district judges, a little bit of skepticism as to how easily one could just kind of, oh, okay, well, that, that rule looks good over there in the Third Geneva Convention. Let's, let's borrow that one. But eventually the, those judges were overruled by the circuit courts. And these days, again, unless something has changed pretty dramatically, I don't see any federal courts pushing back on very, very robust assertions of detention power, very, very broad assertions of what kind of constellations of facts would justify inferring that the person is a, is a member of an organized armed group. And I gave you the one about, hey, you got a lot of money and you were once in an Al-Qaeda guest house. You must be a member of Al-Qaeda. Um, yeah. Individual federal district judges seemed initially quite skeptical of that, but the district court, particularly the DC one, have, I think, essentially uh, eliminated that judicial resistance by being pretty consistently ruling in favor of the government. But again, somebody in here might, might follow the recent more than I have. I'll just note that only one court addresses these cases in the U.S. because all cases from Guantanamo are consolidated in yeah. the 
DC District Court and the DC Court of Appeals. So there is no opportunity for what you would normally see in the US of a uh, growth of different common law approaches and then maybe a split between different courts. It's solely um, consolidated in that one place and then you see, so yes, some different judges, but it's been pretty consistent. I, I, that's that's an years. excellent point. I mean, you really are getting <laughs> one circuit developing most of the law, if not all of the law in this area. Um, oh, actually, she I think she had before you. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. No, y uh, just a, a quick question. Uh, following uh, what Michelle just said, um, what is the scope of the application of this theory that you have presented about the, the, the theory the of the U.S. in detention and in, in the targeting? Is just the U.S. or maybe do you think that this theory can uh, can be promoted for other, I'm sure, members of NATO or other countries. What do you think ab about the, the scope of the, of the application of this theory? That's my specific question. Uh, no, it's it's an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I particularly when I was writing the chapter, I, I, I worked really hard at trying to figure out whether any other state engaged in this kind of analogy, and I really struggled to find any. Um, I don't know whether they, if you asked, you know, uh, a high-ranking member of the UK military. Do you buy this or not? I don't know what they would say. But I don't know of any other state that has formally invoked <laughs> these kinds of arguments by analogy. And it may very well be, I, I'm just speculating here, um, that most other states don't have the very complicated relationship to international <laughs> human rights law that the US has. I'm sure the British military does not like all of the ways that the European Court of Human Rights has interpreted the extraterritorial application of international human rights law. But there's also no question that the UK accepts that international human rights law in some form applies extraterritorially and that they have to deal with the consequences of, of human rights law applying at the same time as international humanitarian law does in certain circumstances. So I think it's a kind of overdetermined hostility to it by the US that they don't want to say that it applies extraterritorially at all. And in case all their allies disagree, well, then they want to be able to, to kind of push aside the human rights law by turning, okay, well, we're going to give you hard law from the Third and Fourth Geneva Conventions or from whatever. So I, I don't really know exactly why the U.S. is so aggressive with analogy, and I, but I don't think that it's, it's a position that has been followed even by many of the allies that we would assume, you know, the Israel, the UK, et cetera, might be very tempted to try to, to maximize their targeting and detention power in the same way. Um, it's an inadequate answer, but I, I can't give you much of a better one. Uh, thank you very much. So I guess I'd just like to kind of hear your thoughts and maybe a couple of things that are sort of extending uh, your argument here a bit. I wonder given, you know, so taking the themes of organized crime and urban conflict that we're dealing with, how, d how might you see the um, sort of prospective extension of these analogies to groups like drug cartels or transnational gangs? Yeah. Um, would you say that they currently fall under the definition of organized armed groups, given that they don't necessarily confront the state on a regular basis? but that they do monopolize violence within certain territories um, and have significant military capacity, yeah. even if their motives are primarily economic rather than political. Um, and then the second question is just, would you see as a similar case of analogizing the extension of the label of terrorist group to street gangs like the Mara Serva Trucha that the US applied from 2013, I think it was, that they listed them as a terrorist group? Um, and does that have anything to do, do you think, with this practice of trying to extend the purview yeah. um, of the capacity to target? B both excellent questions. Um, in, the, in the first one, um, I, I definitely don't see any theoretical reason why you know, narco traffickers or, or any other kind of criminal gang can't be an organized armed group subject to IHL. I mean, if you look at Mexico at certain periods of time, Everybody in here would know the South American context better than, than I do. But certainly, I would reject any kind of you know, knee-jerk fellow lefty conclusion that, oh my god, there's no way that these, organized, that these kinds of criminal bands could be organized armed groups. 
we have criteria. <laughs> we would have to look at the organization of the gang. We would have to look at the hostilities between either the gang and other gangs or the gangs and the government. We would apply the normal Tadic criteria. So I, I don't have a problem with, with that idea, although it's fact-based. <laughs> what I would have a problem with, though, and the reason I really appreciate the question, is I, I think the fact that organized armed groups can encompass things other than just rebels and terrorists that illustrates why the U.S. analogy is so dangerous in the context of membership. I mean, at least we can find rebel groups that actually do have a pretty clear command and control structure, that really do almost always wear uniforms, where we could look at the cooks and cleaners in that organized armed group and say, yeah, actually, they are a fighter. <laughs> they are trained, and they do have a weapon, and they are expected to fight if necessary. There are certainly organized armed groups of the more classic variety that although I would still reject the U.S. approach, wouldn't necessarily raise the same kind of really intractable evidentiary problems. But it's going to be even worse <laughs> for organized armed groups of the drug trafficking variety and the organized crime variety. They're not going to have uniforms. They're not going to have fixed and distinct signs. They're not going to have a clear-cut distinction between who is a member of the group and who isn't. All of the things that I think exist with a lot of organized armed groups of a more classic nature, it's just all going to be worse <laughs> for all these other organized armed groups. So uh, I would think the danger is, you know, the U.S. has a very professional military, and although I don't like a lot of the U.S.'s legal positions, you know, I, in many ways I have tremendous respect for trained militaries because I've worked with untrained militaries, government militaries. So uh, the potential for misuse of this kind of on the surface kind of attractive, but when you actually start looking at it very problematic, U.S. definition of membership, it, all the problems I've identified could be a thousand times worse. Um, and then the second question, I'm not sure I have a great answer for it. I, you know, under IHL, uh, there, I mean, there's no such thing as a terrorist group. We don't care whether a group is a terrorist or a rebel group or organized crime. We care that they're an organized armed group that, you know, has the kind of internal command and control system, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I certainly think that the U.S. takes advantage of the, this rhetorical label of terrorist group to get away with things that, if, that, that they might not even get away with with a, a classic rebel group. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if, if part of trying to bring these groups within the ambit of IHL is also accompanied by an attempt to further delegitimize them by analogizing them to terrorists, um, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, and if I can just kind of add one more thing, and I talk a lot about this in the, in the chapter that, that I loosely adapted this talk from, you know, we've seen a really fundamental change in states' attitudes toward international humanitarian law. Before there was any kind of clear-cut, extraterritorially applicable international human rights law, the last thing that states wanted was IHL to apply. <laughs> they wanted IHL to stay as far away from conflicts as possible because then there was nothing other than domestic law. <laughs> there was no binding human rights law. There were no prohibitive rules of human rights law. IHL was the enemy because if they didn't have IHL, then they really had just their own domestic restraints and that was it. Now that we do have international human rights law and we do have, by most states' account, binding extraterritorial prohibitive rules of international human rights law, now we've seen a fundamental shift. Now states are like, oh, oh no, 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 we want IHL to apply. We don't want to push it away, because if we push it away, human rights law is going to come in. Now we want everything to be an armed conflict, because that way we can apply the rules of IHL that are invariably less restrictive and targeting and detention than human rights law, and to keep the human rights law out. So just as a historical matter, we've seen a really fundamental shift. And it's not an accident that the U.S. now <laughs> wants IHL to apply to essentially any armed drone strike that it engages in anywhere in the world. Because even though it doesn't acknowledge the extraterritorial application of international human rights law, it probably will in the not too distant future. And they would much rather have IHL rules apply than the human rights law rules. Again. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taking the floor again. I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, my first comment is that I, I would love to take you to the Peruvian Congress. <laughs> <laughs> um, with regards to all this discussion, this is something that's very relevant to, to South America. Um, 
with regards, and, and I'm sure some my colleagues in ICRC can provide more, more info on this, uh, but these were discussions that have really um, eh, been developing over the past decade, um, seeing a similar pattern of what you just mentioned. You know, first, there was this rejection of applying IHL, and now everyone wants to apply IHL because they realize that applying I international human rights law could can can mean that they would be in, in further trouble. Um, but I guess, uh, and, and going to my question on uh, extending the analogy of uh, armed groups to other types of, of groups like drug organizations, for example, I, I, I completely agree that we, we can see that synergy in some moments, we've seen, uh, we've seen it here, uh, but I guess m my concern is uh, when that is done without the context of an armed conflict. And uh, here in Peru, there was a whole discussion uh, on two aspects. One was this term, this fusion of, of narco-terrorism groups where uh, the, the guiding ob objective there was to apply IHL rules to situations where it wouldn't apply. Uh, and also to be able to send the military in situations where they wouldn't normally uh, have a jurisdiction or a mandate. Uh, but there was also, and, and I'd love for, for my colleagues from ICRC to provide more intel on this, a, a whole discussion on how even to define a armed group within domestic law as grupo hostil. I, and um, Gianfranco, I'm looking at you because I'm sure you can provide <laughs> this uh, with more intel. But that created a lot of concerns of, uh, and Isaac, I'm sure you followed this uh, discussion as well. Cuando usamos grupo hostil, cuando no usamos grupo hostil, what is the context for that? Um, so uh, I, I appreciate uh, the, the question that uh, Gianfranco uh, from the ICRC delegation also made was, is there any prospective analogy in other states because this, I think, would be music to the ears of many of our states in South America that uh, are still trying, I think, have understood over the past decades on how to distinguish the applicable law within the context, but now would like to uh, <laughs> sort of try to, to blend in some ways, in the ways that are mo more convenient, actually, um, for them, um, these two different areas. So, yeah. so my concern is, yes, we can see other types of groups that are not armed groups per se, with the difficulties of how we define that, you know, beyond the Tadic criteria and everything, but uh, it is concerning for me to see the lack of in any case, uniform guidelines, at least at domestic law, on when we are within one group or when we are within another one. Yeah, I mean, just a couple of quick points, because i <laughs> fully on board with everything you said. Um, you know, uh, part of this is kind of why it's important to be a good old-fashioned positivist. And my lefty friends don't like the fact that I'm such a good positivist. But, you know, you. you Tadic isn't just about the organization of the group, it's also about the hostilities between the group and the government, or at least the group and other groups. And you can't just kind of take half of the test and ignore the other half. That's not really the way it works. And, and lawyers in this part of the world need to keep insisting on the correct application of Tadic. And sometimes that there will be a conflict, and other times they won't. But the worst is, again, the cherry picking. We want to deem you an organized armed group because we can do terrible things to you, but without actually having to find any real conflict between, uh, between you and them. Um, so the, yeah, that's a great point. Then the only other thing is, you know, it is scary because you can see how tempting it would be to go down this analogy route in, in, in this part of the world. Because, I mean, the US, not only does it not accept the extraterritorial application of international human rights law, it doesn't have any court, any regional human rights body sitting in judgment of it. <laughs> you know, this is one of the few parts of the world where human rights law really actually has some bite against governments. And insofar as that bite is there, there's an even greater temptation to find ways to, to push human rights law away and, and get back to the kind of wonderfully state-centered world of, of international humanitarian law. So. I, I can see the incentives kind of built in to, to really 
muddying the waters in terms of the applicable legal framework. But again, I, I defer to those of you who know vastly more about this part of the world than I. So. Okay. Well, thank you for your time and for your attention. And I, I've enjoyed today, and, and I look forward to the next couple of keynotes and, and all the panels over the next couple of days. So thank you.